Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another lecture in the series Perspectives on Economic Liberty, hosted by the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at Arizona State University. I'm Ross Emmett, the director of the center and professor of economic thought in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. I would also welcome you to Adam Smith Week, an initiative of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process at the College of Charleston, South Carolina. Seeing the opportunity that Zoom webinar is presented for expanding our audiences, a number of centers teamed up to bring events all through this week. And you can check that out on the Center for Public Choice and Market Process at the College of Charleston for a complete list of the, um, the various webinars and seminars being presented this week, all connected to themes related to Adam or emerging from work on Adam Smith. The Center for the Study of Economic Liberties Perspectives lecture series emerges from our mission to evaluate the contribution of economic liberty to human betterment. We undertake a variety of programs in economic thought and economic policy. Our Doing Business North America report measures the ease of doing business in 130 cities across Canada, the United States, and Mexico. We also participate in research programs and run conferences in the history and philosophy of economics and on issues related to voluntary governance. The center will also provide support for ASU's new certificate program in philosophy, politics, and economics, starting in the 2021-2022 academic year. One of the ways we fulfill our mission is to invite a variety of guests who interrogate topics related to our center's mission, visiting debates over the role of economic liberty and human betterment, evaluating economic liberty's contribution to human betterment for good or ill, and considering its relation to other human values and freedoms that we may hold. The lecture today by Dr. Bart Wilson, author of The Property Species, Mine, Yours, and the Human Mind, will address the claim that all human beings and only human beings have property in things and that at its core, property rests on custom, not rights. Dr. Wilson is uniquely prepared to address this claim, which emerges from his experimental research in the Economic Science Institute at Chapman University. He earned a Bachelor of Science at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and an MA and PhD at the University of Arizona. Today, he is Professor of Economics and Law and the Donald P. Kennedy Endowed Chair of Economics and Law at Chapman University, and also directs the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy. Well, Dar Bart, after a, a long introduction, welcome to the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, and I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you, Ross, for the invitation to uh, participate during Adam Smith Week and to participate in your seminar series. Let me quick share my screen here. All right, so that is the cover of, of the book and I want to talk about property. So depending on which department you visit at your university, you're going to find that they're going to have very different take on what property is. If you go to biology department, they will tell you that all sorts of animals have property in food, mates and territory. And if you go to the humanities college, you will hear that property is a modern Western European construction. And if you talk to social scientists and legal scholars in the middle, they will dabble in both. They'll tell you that it sure looks like Fido has property in the toys in his mouth. And they will tell you that Native Americans did not have notions of property like their European conquerors did. So seeing these very different perspectives, I as a social scientist want to set out to figure out what is property. And for this uh, talk in particular, I want to spend more time on why do we happen to have it? And my approach in the book is Adam Smithian. He was an acute observer of the world. He took some basic observations as axiomatic truths and then proceeded to build an argument around them. And that is my inspiration for what I want to do in this book. The book is about how we 
human beings perceive the world of useful things and how and why we act in the orderly way that we do regarding them. To an economist, the source of this regularity needs some explanation if we're going to tackle the grander question as it is typically posed to first year students of economics of how a society allocates scarce goods to people with inherently unlimited wants. And start with, take some observations from around the world. <clears throat> You'll notice that there seem to be invisible connections between people and their tools. The Kong of the Kalahari Desert to the Machiguengue of the Amazon to the various Aborigine groups in Australia, there seems to be a connection between people and their tools. This connection is in our stories. Only King Arthur could pull Excalibur from the stone. If you go to primary schools, you will see in this hurly-burly classroom in the winter here, teachers ask questions like, whose mittens are these? And the teacher and all the students only expect one student to answer that question when they hold up the pair of Hello Kitty mittens. Those are mine. So there's an order, there's a pattern to how people engage one another regarding things. And the book is a cross disciplinary synthesis with a distinctly biological eye about how ordinary details we take for granted regarding people and the world of things that we use. So I'm gonna propose a compromise that's gonna make nobody happy. Neither the biologists, nor the humanities scholars, nor the social scientists and legal scholars in the middle. And that is this, that property is a universal and uniquely human custom. Now, biologists will argue that it certainly looks like dolphins have property in their Spanish mackerel prey that they hold in their mouths. And they will argue that baboons seem to respect the harems of, diff of other males and the females that are in them. And that it, scrub jays will rehide their food caches if another scrub jay is watching. And then when that scrub jay on looker goes away, they'll go and rehide them again. So it looks like all these different animals have property. And then humanity scholars are gonna argue, oh, that property is theft and that it's there only to certain groups of humans. Legal centralists, ordinary people, social scientists are also gonna take pause at, if not take issue with the idea that property is a custom for governments surely institute and enforce the rules of property. How is the custom going to return my stolen bicycle you ask? Well, report it to the police and see what happens nothing happens. And that nothing happens does not help us explain why millions of bicycles go unstolen each day. Philosophers and lawyers are gonna say that property rests on rights, not customs. But if we wanna take a big natural historical perspective on what property is, we have to go back and see what's in common with 100 and 300,000 years ago. And rights are a very modern notion. They're very modern, they're very dem democratic, they're very bourgeois, that they're very about equality, liberty. And so that is something that may not go all the way back for 300,000 years. And we wanna see what it's at the core of property. I'm gonna argue that it's custom. So we need to start with some hard to dispute facts. And one of those facts for the people in the humanities is that all human groups have property in tools, utensils, and ornaments. And in every language, people can say, this is mine, and you can't make such a declaration in any simpler concepts. That's as simple as it gets. And to the biologists, whatever non-human property might be, the effect of it is that baboons and scrub jays and dolphins defend themselves against dispossession but no one has to teach their young to resist dispossession. Possession, however, is only nine points of the law. And the last 10th is important. Nine tenths of the focus on property is on the effects of property. Every non-human example of property from biology is about possession, exclusive use, 
and defense of food mates in territory and nature. In every human example of the absence of property from the humanities in some anthropologists is about the non-exclusive use of certain things by certain peoples. So what biology does is it compares like effects across species and the humanities and anthropologists compare unlike effects within a species. But it's when you consider the last tenth, the origins of property in humans, and not simply it's like and unlike effects, that we can begin to trace out what it is and how it works. So how might a social scientist go about defining property? It's clear that whatever it is, it involves people doing something with a material thing. And it also involves that a notion of it being taught, that property isn't discovered anew each generation. No is how parents teach their children the rules of property. And so I want to change our question slightly here and answer it to answer this question of why do humans have the custom of property? Because it will shed light on the purpose that property serves in modern society and how to view it. Now, Aristotle gave us four types of explanations, the material, formal, efficient, and final explanation. And when taken as a whole, these four different causes explain the custom of property. So let's start with the material explanation. There's no sugarcoating it. The material explanation is the hardest to swallow. So humans have the custom of property because when our body sees, hears, and touches the physical world, it connects a certain person to a certain thing by classifying the thing as mine. Thinking about the custom of property as a physical phenomenon does not come naturally to me, nor does it, I imagine, come easily to most people. But a material explanation requires physical matter, and some relevant matter for property is the human body itself. Our eyes see the world of people and things, and our ears hear things people say about things, and our minds classify these neurophysical impulses stimulated by the physical world and return as output an instruction to act, to say things like, this is mine. The first difficulty in accepting this explanation is its scope. So research in linguistics by Cliff Goddard and Anna Wiersbeke seem to indicate that the material explanation applies to human universalities. In every language, people can say this thing is mine. And in every language, it means this thing is mine. People using such diverse languages as Arabic, East Cree, English, Yu, Finnish, Koromu, Langu, Mandarin Chinese, Vietnamese can all utter the claim, this is mine. Now have linguists exhausted every single language on the planet, you ask? No. But given the rather diverse languages that they have studied, for the sake of being diverse, consider for the moment the possibility that they might be right. Is there any other independent evidence that could corroborate the claim? Yes. Anthropologists spanning the second half of the 20th century, George Murdoch, Donald Brown, Ralph Linton, have concluded that in every culture known to history or ethnography, quote, all human groups have property, concepts of property, and recognize personal property in tools, utensils, ornaments, and so forth. So however minimal it may be, there are some things about which only a particular individual can say, this is mine. The second most difficult part to accept is that Homo sapiens is the only animal whose mind classifies a thing as mine. Primatologists have good reason to believe that chimpanzees think things like, I want this. They point at and they request grapes and wonder bread like any human who wants something sweet. It's also not a stretch to grant that a squirrel or a dolphin or a scrub jay can think in the moment, I want this about some food. But I want this does not mean the same thing as this is mine in the human animal. 
as every two-year-old learns with great disappointment from their parents. The abstract concept of mine stands outside the here and now. Mine means mine, atomically and reflexively, and it serves as the core for the customer property in all human groups. So humans have the customer property because when our body sees, hears, and touches the physical world, it connects a certain person to a certain thing by classifying the thing as mine. The formal explanation. Property is not just one person feeling and thinking this is mine. And property is not a growl delivered with a curled lip and a wrinkled nose. Property is a speech act jointly intended to by other people, all of whom have been taught by the previous generation the circumstances under which such claims can be made. While the circumstances and set of things can vary from culture to culture, there is a common abstract form by which someone can claim something as mine. Humans have the custom of property because people learn from their mentors the circumstances of their community under which one, someone can say this thing is mine. Two, people can know that what this person says is true. And three, other people cannot say this thing is mine. When I say this watch is mine, the utterance is predicated upon something more than an iconic message of aggression. I aim to do something, a la J.L. Austin and John Sorrell, with my words. I aim to clarify or perhaps change how your mind classifies the things. The claim is predicated on the abject notion that other people can know that what I say is true. Now, how do other people know that what I say is true? Such a truth is not like the speed of light, a physical constant in the universe. My audience and I have learned from our mentors when such words are true. And insofar as the custom relies and what other people can know, it's not subjective. But insofar as I confidently say, this is mine, the custom is not objective either. Property transcends this subjective objective dichotomy. However, human communities apply property to whatever set of things, the formal explanation is that the way we think about property is intersubjective. And just as only I can use the concept I to refer to myself, only I can use the concept mine to predicate a claim on something that I have property in. Both first personal concepts are singular. If I can say about the watch, this is mine, then other people cannot say the same thing about the very same watch. I'm using the word cannot in the sense of social rules, of social constraint that comes from people knowing that what I say is true. I'm not saying that two different people don't ever feel inclined to claim the same thing as mine. I'm saying that the formal explanation of property includes a notion of a community equilibrium about the rules. If other people know that what I can say about the watch is true, then by the same community knowledge, the social constraint on other people is that they cannot say about the very same thing, this is mine. And even though only I can use the concept mine to predicate a first person claim on something, everyone else in the community must use the concept yours. I thus rely on the concept yours when I want others to acknowledge my claim on something. So mine and thine are intertwined. The customer property is jointly reciprocal. If there are things about which I can say this is mine, there are other things that are yours, you can say about it, this is mine. There is no abstract concept of yours in any other animal because there is no abstract concept of mine in any other animal. The material and formal explanations come together in the human agency that composes the efficient cause. So the primeval sensations at the heart of property are the harm or injury an organism feels and the concomitant resentment when it perceives that a member of its species has severed its connection with an object. Humans have the customer property 
because when someone severs our connection to a certain thing, we resent the injury and attempt to defend ourselves by beating back the injury with some injury in return. Third parties temper those flames of contention by spelling out for the community what the expectations of the disputants should have been. And this is where my theory is Adam Smithian. This is taken straight from the theory of moral sentiments. So resentment is the odious sentiment that prompts us to retaliate injury. It isn't unique to humans. There's a reason why you don't poke a bear or even stand between a sow and her cubs. But what is unique to humans is that we turn over our disputes to elders, judges, and juries to sift through completing claims of this is mine. So on a tribal species, we tend to share our in-group resentments and empathize with in-group injuries. And so two conflicting claims of this is mine can easily escalate to group on group violence. To mitigate that risk of destroying the community, humans have stumbled upon the tradition of using third parties to articulate what the people of the community know about the dispute and what the expectations of the disputants should have been. Finally, the final explanation. If, as David Hume noted, material things were not scarce and people by nature not mischievous, selfish, and limited in generosity, we would not need the customer property. There would be no conflicting claims of this is mine. We would be bonobos in abundant fields of leaves and herbs. But that is not the world we live in. Humans have the cost of property because it confers peace to a species which is, as the 17th century German jurist Samuel von Pufendorf eloquently put it, often malicious, insolent, and easily provoked, and as powerful in affecting mischief as it is ready in designing it. The use and enjoyment of things is the ultimate purpose in having things, and it satisfies thoughts of wanting things. But the custom of property did not arise from the use of things. We practice the custom of property because approximately there is no shortage of people with an equal or stronger hand who may challenge our claim of this is mine. Such is the story of Nabus Binyard. The uniquely human custom of property stood between Ahab and the vineyard to protect Naboth from those who had a stronger hand to challenge his claim. When Jezebel suggests that Ahab king up and take something if the alpha wants it, it was not the custom of property that failed Naboth. Ahab's character failed Naboth, Jezebel, and everyone who practiced the custom and depended upon it for their protection. The custom of property doesn't make us do evil things. An ethical character restrains our unlimited thoughts of I want this with a cultivated respect for that is yours. And so it is those four different reasons of why we have property that come together to explain this custom that is unique to humans. And so this to kind of refresh the, the controversial claim that I make is that property is universal and uniquely human custom. I've had very good friends come up to me and say, this is interesting, it's, but why do you have to make this only human? And the point is, I think it's right. Uh, following Michael Polanyi, I put these pieces together. And if you're going to try to understand how humans have this custom and then connect it back to our primate cousins and then compare our primate cousins to the rest of the animal kingdom, you can only say that there's something else going on here when we get to humans regarding things. That when we use our tools, we're doing something very different in the world than any other animal. And so whether you're talking about food mates and territory is one thing, but tools are a whole nother thing because the impulses for food mates and territory are in the moment, but tools are not in the moment. They persist 
and they persist into the future. And something new has to explain these compound things that we created, this great change in how tools are made and used in the animal kingdom when compound spears were first uh, discovered about 400, 500,000 years ago. There's something new going on here and how we deal with them. And it's from these things and tools that the abstract idea of this is mine goes from contained in a thing called a spear to go to land, to go to now in the modern world, we put a little property around things called ideas. And so the abstract idea gets applied over and over and extended. And that's what is partly responsible for why human beings are the only species on the planet to extend the, their, um, extend their, um, excuse me, they, they are, to make their lives longer, more comfortable, and, and, and to spread this kind of wealth around the nation, around the world. Property is this core idea that changed how the world became rich. It's not necessary. It, it's a necessary component, but it's not a sufficient component. And that is kind of the unique part that we have this idea of how we think about the world that made the world as it is today. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to questions. Take that off. Thank you, Bart. Um, we're starting to get some questions. I'll let a, a couple more in as I thank you for uh, um, giving a succinct, careful, and clear explanation uh, for you, uh, for, for your uh, ideas. And that will certainly help us in uh, identifying uh, questions and, and exploring it together in the time we uh, still have. Um, I want to remind the audience that uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, put it in the Q&A at the bottom of the, your screen. And we currently have two questions in the, the Q&A. And um, as we ask them, they will be marked as answered and, uh, and, the other, and we'll be able to keep a log of the questions. And um, I, I welcome people to ask questions. We have about 60 people on the, um, on, on the, uh, the call here with us. So that will be, uh, we, we hopefully will generate quite a good group. Um, Robert Morf asked um, quite early in the conversation about intellectual property. Um, and is there anything in your converse, in your discussion of property that would distinguish um, at a fundamental level intellectual property from the physical, you know, you, you were constantly referencing physical things. Um, would you, how would you distinguish an intellectual property like a copyright or a patent from, from that or would you? So one of the first things that did for me and how I think about property is that it really that it made it understand why we have such problems with intellectual property. What is what makes intellectual property so difficult? Because if our minds are made to put property in a physical thing, and I didn't really go into this in, in, in my remarks, but I have a whole chapter on this in the book. We've, if our minds are built to put property inside a physical thing, then and it has a boundary the inside and outside and where the thing goes, so goes my property in it. What makes intellectual property so difficult is there's no boundary. <laughs> it's amorphous, it's an idea, it's out there. And the whole problem of intellectual property is defining where that is. <laughs> and so it seems to be easier, for example, when we're looking with drugs because it's a chemical compound. And so we just bound, we can draw the boundary by that chem, the boundaries of that chemical. But if it comes with an ideal or um, uh, ideas of coming from arts and other things like that, music, it's hard to tell where they end and where they begin. And so, and that explains kind of why it's a tension. It also then explains why uh, different groups of people are gonna think about property differently. <laughs> And so um, I came, you know, came of age and then when MP3 started coming out, when, when music became digital and um, Napster was this thing that was posting music up there in files. And there's a whole generation of people who thought, 
well, you just post the music up there in a file and you download it here. Nothing's been destroyed. It's just been duplicated out there. Then there's nothing wrong with that. That's not actually stealing. <laughs> and where that comes from is this, they have this notion of property coming from a physical world where if I take the pen and I don't have it anymore, now we have a problem. But if I just kind of multiply it and copy it, then the world is okay. And so I have, the book is about physical property and how it starts, but I think it sets up why it's such a difficult problem in, in the modern world when it's applied to intellectual property. I think the other kind of core kind of message that comes out of this, that we have this instinct to want to define these things from the top down. <laughs> And in like in that last example, if there are different ways that people are thinking about this idea, they're gonna be clashing. We wanna think about how their minds are thinking about property and kind of build it from the way up. And of course, since Napster is not a thing anymore, why? Because technology changed how we think about the world and now we're no longer putting the actual physical file property in. We stream the ability just to have a pull it off of Spotify and other, other sources. And so technology, got us out of the problem <laughs> in a way that um, we needed to kind of, that all that time that was spent litigating this and thinking about how to define intellectual property 20 years ago, um, well, was in a sense resolved on its own. So um, I don't have any more, um, more specific policy prescriptions for how intellectual property works, but I would, kind of hope that gets you to think about where it comes from. Well, how is it that our mind thinks about these ideas and then build the custom and the way of dealing with the problems and the conflicts from the ground up? Following on that, uh, people are still are, are asking some of the tough questions. Um, how, how do your ideas about property relate to a commons and communal ownership? Um, I, I can think of, you know, Eleanor Ostrom's work uh, that would might be helpful, but um, I'll let you uh, take it, take it away. Well, what, again, if property starts out with this thing that's got a boundary and that that's the beginning part and it's in these tools, then the commons problem is it's about something with, about which no one can say this is mine. <laughs> And that whole problem that Eleanor studied was how is it then, because no one can say that, how do we solve what happens if no one can say this is mine about something? And so it's not a, it's not an accident that when groups of people have to work together to make something, so if you go to the Native Alaskans and they work together to build a canoe, no one can say about that canoe, this is mine, because they all put something into it. And so um, they find a way to solve, but how is it that we get people to join together in this collaborative effort to create this thing? Commons problems are the other way in the sense of there's this thing out there that we can't, that no one can claim is mine. Now, how do we get together and solve this solution, solve this problem that people are gonna use something up? And so the different solutions are, re are, are, are getting around this problem of claiming things as mine. Um, and, and I think um, I'll just leave it at that for right now. Okay, we'll see what happens. How has our view of property evolved as a result of the easy access of millions of goods through Amazon and the internet? What trends do you foresee in our relationship with property as accessibility increases even more? Well, I, one of the things that has happened is because there's so much stuff around that we forget the reason why we have rules of property. <laughs> and I think that is what, when we live in a world of abundance, then the problem becomes of how do we just get the stuff to move around? <laughs> and if we have this global bird's eye view of how we want to move stuff around, we're going to start kind of infringing upon this notion of individual things that people can claim as, as mine. And so I think what, one of the reasons, I mean, it was certainly wasn't the way I thought about property when I started studying this uh, 15 years ago, that property is a way of creating peace <laughs> and conferring peace to it, to us. Um, and we seem to have lost that in the modern world of things. We get so used to having stuff around that we didn't understand why 
we had to create these boundaries around things that we that we called mine. And, and so we can't, it's, the modern world is built on this really core idea and we can't forget the core ideas that make all of the stuff that's been built on top of that work. And one of those claims is uh, rights are built on top of the stuff. It's built all the way up. That's what makes a polity of you know, 300 million people possible and other polities of the billions of people possible that we create these other structures, but they're built on something basic and something human. And that's what I'm trying to get people to think about that those are at the core before we start thinking about the world through these macro ideas of, of rights and, and in countries and, and distributions. Lucas asks, how has our view of property evolved as a result of the, oh, that was the one I just answered. We, you just answered, sorry, I lost track of who had asked that question. Um, Roy Miller um, from right here in Arizona. What kind of property is most difficult to justify, patent or copyright? Well, the hazier the uh, boundary or the, the more the lack of a boundary, the harder it is to define. And so um, that would be the, gen the general rule because you don't, you, the, the advantage of this is it only goes as far as this thing. And so I can, don't create conflicts with other people. It only goes as far as the end of the end of this under this pen. And so if you have copyrights and they extend way out, then this um, it, it gets more difficult where you find that that boundary. And so it it's you could probably have copyrights that are less that have clear boundaries, and you can have copyrights with less boundaries, and you can do that with all types of intellectual property. And I would imagine, for me, the testable thing would be out there where you're seeing more conflicts if you can have some way of measuring what, how these boundaries are between the different things. So it, it really depends, I think, on the boundaries. That's what makes it clear. Hmm. You noted that parents tell us no. That's how we learn about property. But parents also tell us to share. So um, isn't this? A little contradictory, and uh, why can it be? Is it confusing or not? Well, that's the thing that children are learning. They're good. They they learn from these very generic, these very specific encounters, and then their minds are going to create these abstract rules from that as they get older. And by the time they get to three and five, they're going to start understanding how other minds work, and they're going to start putting together what the abstract rule is. So um, and this was made clear to me um, in uh, with some colleagues when we were out, out for dinner. And um, so one of my colleagues, uh, with both of the, they have two colleagues who had kids each who were three, three years old at the time. And one of them had this Thomas the toy train. And this was so important. Tyler is one of his, you know, Miles's favorite toys. And when they're out for dinner and Owen, another three-year-old, was looking at this thing with these big eyes, like, oh, this is a fantastic thing over there. And so Miles's parents had to really coax him to kind of give that Thomas the Troy train over to Owen to use. And I mean, the, the look in his eyes, he was hanging over, was like, oh, am I ever going to see this thing again? <laughs> like, it's going to be gone. And um, and Owen is use, using it. He's playing around for 10, 15 minutes. You know, food comes, and then Owen's parents say, "Now give that back." <laughs> and so, um, sharing is part of mine. You get to share things with it, but you don't just get to use it forever and take it off with you either. <laughs> sharing is uh, there are circumstances around this that kind of circumscribe what you mean by when you claim is mine. So what my what we're teach what pa Miles's parents were teaching him was that you can call that Tom's Detroit toy train mine. It is yours. It goes with you when it goes off to Ma Owen's hands. <laughs> it's still yours, and it will be coming back to you by the custom that the parents of Owen's are, Owen are going to enforce. And so, mine doesn't mean it's absolute. <laughs> uh, 
the culture around, you know, Southern California boys you know, a few years ago is that you're going to have to kind of let other pe kids use this thing. But in the end, Miles still gets to go home with it and put it, sleep with it that night. And so they're learning all those facets of property just in those little, those little, um, little exchanges. Uh, there's a, I, I mean, and this is important, uh, um, kind of all the things that the kids are taking in when we teach them and we say no. Uh, this came clear to me when I saw this um, British cartoon called Bing, he's a preschool bunny. Um, he, and each episode is about walking around and learning life, how to interact in the world with his caregiver flop. And this particular episode called not yours, Bing goes into a, a grocery store. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I remember that one moment when I went in the grocery store as a kid and like, look at all this stuff. <laughs> like it's all over, this is this is amazing place. And Bing goes in there in this episode and goes off to the far corner by, while by himself and pulls out a lollipop, takes off the wrapper, licks it. And then when he's called to go home, sticks it in his pocket. And when they leave, they're walking outside, he pulls it back out to have, have a lick and Flop asks him, what do you have there? He goes, it's mine, it's a strawberry lollipop, I found it. And then Flop has to explain to Bing that no, no, did you pay for that? No, well then that's Flop's. <laughs> and, and so it's called stealing if we just take things. Now notice what's kind of embedded in that. It's all about not yours, but it's because finding things is, you just can't claim them as mine because this thing has been created. It's in flop store. It's, it's not something that just forms out their nature all by itself. And we teach the kids that whenever they go to stores, they just can't claim things. They say, we say no, but that doesn't mean that if you go home, you bring back a bag of lollipops that you can't also share it <laughs> afterwards. It's you're learning when, what the rules are, what the custom is of when you can claim things as mine and when you have to then also share the use of them with others. It's, it's very local and kind of built from the ground up. And the kids are amazing in being able to distinguish no and you can do this or you must do this or sharing this and things like that. They pick up those rules pretty amazingly. Um, as, as they get older. But there's a lot of content going on in those, those early lessons of, of no and you must share. Thank you. So what are the implications for the study of economics or for practicing and teaching economics as a discipline? If we begin from the, your universal and customary premise rather than from the notion of property rights. So, I would suggest reading, going to chapter nine in the book. That's where I kind of, built, I spent the whole previous eight chapters building up to this moment. Because when you read your principles of microeconomics book, you're going to find about four sentences in the introductory chapter in the average book about property rights. And most of the time they're gonna tell you that if governments must force property rights, otherwise farmers aren't gonna grow their crops and people aren't gonna make their music and things like that. And the reason that government protects property is not why we don't go around stealing things. <laughs> that, that can't be the, like if, if just because the government's enforcing this can't be the reason why we all go around not stealing. In particular, because that's not why kids don't go around stealing. They don't go around because they think the police are gonna haul them off. They go around because they've learned these rules from their, from their parents. And that the government is then putting these in the, putting them into codif codifying them to solve all those kind of marginal cases of people who are not following along with what's going on there. So that's kind of the beginning point that I don't think we, we understand the notions of what property is about start uh, from, from the ground not necessarily at this kind of macro level of the, of the economy. But second of all, that economics is about how we exchange things, that that's what the study is about. And prop, that only happens in humans because we have this thing called property. So here, the, if economics is founded on exchange, and I think this is how Adam Smith thought about the world, he thought about it that no other animals out there exchanging one thing for another thing. 
and then he builds kind of the wealth of nations off of that. That our core study of economics doesn't start off with that point. And it means that we have to have these really interesting ideas that no other animal has, and that is this idea of this is mine. Because if it's a, a speech act, as I claim, that I say this is mine, then the only way we get to trade is if I sit down and say, this is not mine, this is yours. And Ross does the same thing for me with something else. And what we've done is we've taken this physical thing and changed it. <laughs> Even though the way we, we've, we changed how we perceive it. Even though in the physical world, nothing's different. We see these two different things, the thing that Ross is holding in his hands, the thing that I'm holding in my hand, and they're not the same things as they used to be. In the, they're now different. And that happens because, Cup, yes, I can force, I look into the future and I can imagine a world where Ross has the pen in his hand and I have the cup in my hand. And that only happens when I sell, say those magic words, this is not mine, this is yours, and Ross does the same thing. That's how you get trade off the ground. And the point of the book to say that this is only happens in humans is to understand why humans are the only species to trade one thing for another thing. That we are the only ones who can do that with our minds, look at the thing, change the way the thing, what the thing is by our perceptions with just some, some vocalizations that come out of our mouth. And it involves us thinking outside right here, right now, and imagining a future where these things are switched. And that I understand Ross's mind that he wants to accomplish this, and he understands my mind that accomplishes. And that's amazing because you can't get bonobos and chimpanzees to do that. I work with primatologists. They have tried their hardest to get these, these non-human primates to change things, to get more viable things. They know how they like things and they can't get, they can't get them to trade them because they can't get outside the here and now, because they can't imagine saying some words that changes how the other animal thinks about the world and then seeing and making that, that trade possible. That's how economics should start. <laughs> that we start with this very, and it starts with mine and it starts with yours because otherwise Ross is trying to fight me for this and take it, or I'm trying to fight Ross for it. And we're not gonna, that's not gonna make us better off either. So we have to have these rules that define these lines of this is mine and that is yours. And then we have to have this ability with our ideas to get us into a better world. And that's what gets the study of economics off the ground. And it starts with mine and yours. I, I think that the question that Andres asked, um, it was just answered by this last response. So I'm going to um, leave that. And Andreas, if you want to bring it back on the table, uh, feel, please feel free to, if you have another um, connection on it, it seems that the, um, it, that the, the issue is the two-sidedness of the uh, process and not just the one-sidedness of it. Um, Joe Cobb wants you to extend your ideas to the uh, non-fungible tokens question that uh, works like copyrights and pat patents. Can you discuss how they might work? I, I think I need a little bit more. What do you mean by non-fungible tokens in okay. that context? Joe, how about you uh, give us another question with the explanation because uh, Bart doesn't know what non-fungible tokens are. Neither do I. So I'll, we'll, we'll move on to some other questions. Um, what would you say explains the defense of another's property? Morgan Kemp asks. Or the odd cultural practice of asking a, I, I like this one. Uh, you go and you ask a seemingly trustworthy stranger to watch a personal item while you handle a matter, some, some issue you have to deal with. Well, so the, so the first part of that was like, why is it that if somebody had something else taken that we come to their, to come to their defense? This, this comes straight out of Adam Smith. He, he got this, he, he saw this very clearly, um, uh, that it comes through this empathizing with the resentment that they feel when they are harmed. Like, because this thing is physical and it has a boundary and it's no longer you know, taken away by somebody else, I feel I'm worse off. And my instinct is I'm upset. I want, they did something bad to me and I want to think bad things about them. <laughs> and 
the empathy that other people share that with me is what then gets property off the ground that we're going to we got to come up with some rules to settle this so we don't have any conflict and this came out really clearly in my experimental work so i kind of kind of in piecing the arguments of the book together this was one of the first parts that it came together for me from running my experiments with um vernon smith and eric kimbrough and, and, and others about kind of taking um how does property emerge in a, in a laboratory economy? And what, what we, so we created worlds where they were creating different items and they can move them to, or they can move them from, and there were no instructions about this. They just kind of learned it on their own and items fly all over the screens. Once they discover they can move them from other people and they could chat. And it's in this chat that we see that kind of process kind of unfold that they will, when, they, when people are constantly taking items from other people, they make pleas to them and saying like, don't you see you're hurting us? And what they're doing is they're trying to get other people to join them in that moral claim. Look, you're doing bad things to us. And if there are six people in a, in the, in a world and five of them are complaining and there's one outsider, they always will get to, they get to, are successful in getting that one outside, one person who's taking things from other people to come around. They make all these claims about we make more money, we are hurting us, all those things. And the person will come around if they're the only one out there. <laughs> and it's because they got that empathy of all those other people who feel their same pain and are gonna make claims out there about what, how should we settle this? And they'll come up with rules. If things are over this way, then they're yours and I won't touch them. If things are another way, you leave them that way. And different groups can come up with different ways of solving this. But the point is they use that empathy of re with the resentment of the harm to get us to join in. And uh, so that thing just gets extended when a person comes up to me and says, will you kind of watch my stuff as I go to the restroom here for, for quickly, which actually just happened to me today in a jury assembly room. <laughs> complete strangers, all of us up there. We, no one knows anyone else. Someone goes off to the restroom and just asked me to look at their, uh, look at their computer sitting on their chair while they move, go away. Why do they trust me? Because they, I, they, they're relying on my empathy that I wouldn't want my thing taken if I went away. And so we're switching places in our minds. We're feeling what they're feeling, putting ourselves in those positions. And we have this commitment to respect these things that we claim a, as mine. And that's all shared with us, which makes it cultural, which makes it kind of un understood. And we can get the stuff off the ground. It's not guaranteed if you then go to places that are very different from yours. Um, but here, as long as we have the same background knowledge about how the world works and how we respect things and how people feel about their things, that you can get all of that kind of solidarity working um, when it dealing with things. Thanks. Tony, I'm coming back to you in a minute. Peter, first, let me say uh, thank you very much for sharing your Adam Smith week with so many other centers and, uh, and, and uh, being the, the overall host for, the, for all the events of this week that are part of Adam Smith week. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, and perhaps this uh, connects to your question. How do we go from the concept of property and mine to the concept of exchange, both of which are important for peace? So it, it, we go from that, from being able to understand that other people can say the same thing about other things, that this is mine, that we can, we get those two minds off the ground and then we can imagine where the world is where these things are, are switched. And it's that imagination, it's that thinking outside the here and now that gets exchange off the ground. And there, I mean, these amazing stories of, you know, ships going up to an island and then putting stuff on the ground and then they go back to ships and then the people on the island come out and they move things around and they're just shifting them around to kind of decide in the exchange ratios and they don't speak the same language <laughs> that they know that they operate with the same core idea of mine and yours and now it's just a matter of working out how much of yours and mine are we going to get together to move this stuff kind of exchange this stuff and make us better off 
it's amazing that all human groups exchange one thing for another thing. And that can't be, um, I don't think that's unrelated to all human groups have property in at least some things called tools. That that, that is the common thing that gets there, gets a uh, trade off the ground is starting with mine. So I, I think otherwise, um, you, you have to find some, if, you, if you're not gonna accept that we all have mine and yours and that we can understand that in other people and we can trade, then you still, then you have to come up with another reason. Why is it that human trade stuff that persists when no other animal does? And I haven't found a good story from that from anyone else. I'll go back to Tony now uh, regarding sharing. Uh, Tony says, it's not only that the parents are teaching that the toy train will come back, but it teaches issues about trust. Share the train with the other child, it'll come back, you can trust him. Humans are trustworthy. Right? Sharing rituals are important. This is also true of gifting. Gifting things to other people is an indication that you're willing to relinquish property if relinquishing it will benefit society. And see Larry Iana Coney's notions about sacrifice, that's an important essay. Yeah. So, so gift, I mean, so I think I, what, so what's the question in there? I'm sorry, I missed that. I, I, I don't see, I think it's a statement and he wants to see if you uh, have any ideas. Um, um, uh, well, I, I think the key part of that when you talk about trust is that, that this notion of property is embedded in a culture of how things are done and what we take, what we all know and can take for granted about how things work. So I wouldn't take trust for granted, right? Uh, trust is kind of something that communities build up and that we have common expectations. So I remember the first time I went to Argentina and I get come show up at the Buenos Aires to come back home and they're like, wrapping the luggage in plastic. <laughs> I'm like, um, we don't do this <laughs> in the United States because they have a different level of trust about dealing with your luggage. And, um, and so it's not there in the impersonal way in, a, um, in an airport, the same way it is in, in, the, in the United States. And so I don't think you, I think property can make trust work, also trust will then kind of reinforce it, but it's not for sure. <laughs> uh, because property isn't out there by itself. It is part of all the other kind of customs and relationships that people have with each other in the group. And so um, it depends on those people and the things involved and their tempers and all those other things that go into what makes a group of people do what they do. And so um, it, it so trust is related to property, but it's not. Um, it's not. Um, it's not necess It's not going to be necessarily the same in every group. Thank you. Uh, Joe has come back with uh, explanation about NFT, uh, non fungible tokens, and I think uh, I think Mason can send that to you, and perhaps uh, I can get you in touch with Joe so you can discuss that with him. And, and Tony has another comment about uh, um, the rituals that enforce trust and empathy. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a notion of like how gifts and so that you give gifts and, you, and so you're expected to give gifts and you pass it around. And, and one of the reasons that was always behind that that if you refuse to give, that's basically a declaration of war. <laughs> and so, um, so they use this notion of a, of a gift in mind and then giving it to you, and then you're gonna, then you're gonna be expected then to give it on and gift it. And, and in re either refusing the gift uh, or not giving the gift are going to be this notion of, of kind of hostilities now can uh, commence. A and that's not kind of unrelated to my theory about why property confers peace. It's just another way of using stuff and who's, who, who has 
uh, uh, claims to it at this moment as a way of signaling, as a symbol of we're at peace and now we can trade. Um, but if you then kind of reject that, then that's basically saying we're, at, we're now at war. And so kind of um, the notions of mind in war and peace are all kind of tied together, um, whether it's a gift or whether they're not gifts. Well, Bart, I'd like to thank you for taking an hour at the end of this long day for you to uh, spend some time talking about uh, mine and yours and property and um, look forward to uh, interacting about that further. Uh, I, I suspect some of the participants will uh, contact you about questions on, uh, they might have. And uh, feel free to do that. Um, you can find Bart relatively easily if you search for him at uh, Chapman University, which is his home.